equals j. If I want the cubic one, well, you'll see that this is tau tensor tau of something like um, 1 tensor xk plus uh, uh, xi tensor, what, x, x, uh, sorry, xj tensor 1, uh, decorated with some delta functions. And anyways, this is involves monomials of shorter degree. And so you keep on going. So you'll be able to get everything. Okay. And with D, it's not so, so difficult to check that. All right. So uniqueness is just some, some induction and, 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 and uh, recursion. Now, what is more complicated is, or not more, more complicated, what's left to do is to check that actually in the case that you have freeness and that xi are free semicircular variables, we do have this, this equation, right? And this is this trick that I already explained to you. There is this representation on a Fox space and this right creation operator, R. So we have this, remember, if I write xi as L, say, of hi plus L of hi star with hi orthonormal, um, then I, I can look at this operator Ri, which is right tensor multiplication by Hi. And then it satisfies these identities that Ri xj is delta ij p omega, where p uh, omega, remember, was this uh, vacuum vector, this vector of, of degree zero. Okay, and then moreover, you have these relations that Ri omega is the same thing as Xi omega, and Ri uh, star omega is zero. And then, uh, well, the, the point is that you have the following formula, what's on the, written on the bottom. I'm claiming that Ri, uh, say, z, is equal to di of z hash p where this hash is defined here. So the hash is the way a tensor acts on something is to multiply it on left and right. OK. So where does this formula come from? Well, uh, this, this del i is a kind of a universal derivation. In fact, anything that's, that satisfies the Leibniz rule somehow factors through uh, this derivation del i. So if I have delta from uh, my, my algebra A into any, any module K, any derivation, then uh, del of, of some polynomial of x1, xn can be written as, well, I simply uh, differentiate each of the variables xj, and then I look at uh, di, uh, dj of p, and I hash it, and I sum it like that. And the reason for it is very simple. I mean, how would you compute del of this polynomial? Well, you would apply Leibniz rule all the time, right? So suppose your polynomial is, say, uh, xi1, xik, or something like that. <clears throat> how would you compute del of that? Well, you would write it as a sum uh, um, of decompositions of your monomial uh, Q as A times one of the variables, xj, let's say, B, right? Uh, and then you would put here A, uh, your derivative of xj, times B. This is what the Leibniz rule dictates, right? But this is exactly del j of P, of Q, sorry, right, hashed with del of xj, because this thing here is a tensor b hash del of xj, and these a tensor b come from applying the free difference quotient to q. Right? So it's a very simple algebraic fact. And so this here, that's a derivation. So I can write down that same formula for my derivation of taking the commutator with R. So I can write down 
that the commutator of R with some z is equal to the sum R, what am I doing, R i, um, of um, d j of z hashed with, well, taking R j with x, sorry, R i with x, j, right, this is the formula here. And now, of course, this is zero unless i equals j, so this is just di of z hash p, exactly as I advertised. Okay? All right, so now, did I do it on, no, I didn't do it on the other slides, so let me do it on the board. So now let's do the computation. So why do I have this equation here? Well, um, what is, this, what is this thing here? Remember, we can magically write it as the trace of p omega uh, xi. Uh, let me reverse it. Since it's a trace, I can just put in front q in front like this. So I'll write q xi. OK? And now I remember that I have these properties here. And these properties tell me that actually xi omega is the same thing as ri, sorry, xi p omega is the same as ri p omega, and then p omega ri is zero, because this says that the range of ri is perpendicular to omega, so if I compose the projection onto omega with the image of ri, I get zero. Okay, so let's use it here. I can rewrite this as the trace of p omega q r i p omega. So at this point, I've just used this identity that multiplying p omega on the left with x i is the same as multiplying it with r i. And now I'm going to add 0, actually subtract 0. I'll say minus trace of p omega r i q p omega. Uh, I'm subtracting 0 because p omega r i is 0. Okay? And now this is the same thing as the trace of p omega commutator R, uh, Q R I Q R I P omega but that's by this formula the same thing as the trace of P omega D I Q hash P omega uh, P omega Okay, so now all we have to uh, convince ourselves is that the trace of p omega a tensor b hash p omega p omega to compute what that is. Well, this is just the trace, just use the definitions, p omega a, p omega b, p omega, and that's trace of a, trace of b. Remember that p omega is rank one, right? So, uh, so, so that's it, right? Because what this then is, is just tau tensor tau of diq, which is exactly what we wanted to prove. So I've done it in the case that d is scalars, but if, if d aren't scalars, there's a very similar argument, only you insist also that this ri commutes with d, so this derivation kills d. Okay? So to sum up, what we've checked is that this equation characterizes freeness from D and being, a sem being semicircular. So now let's check that this equation is almost verified on our random matrices. So let's do this. So I will denote by omega k of ij the function which assigns, which picks out the ijth entry of the kth matrix, right? So the setting, just to remind you, is that we have these matrices a, A1, N, A, D, N. So these are self-adjoined N by N matrices with uh, Gaussian entries, complex Gaussian entries. So if you like, there are functions on uh, N by N matrices self-adjoined to the power K or the power d, 
right? And so omega i j k is simply the i j k. I mean the i j th entry of of this matrix view, the view, kth matrix view, viewed as a function uh, on my space. All right. So now because because my my law on the matrices is Gaussian, I have every right to write down the Stein situation uh, for those entries. So what I'm writing here is the thing that I wrote on the board before, that if I integrate with respect to the Gaussian me measure, this function, this linear function on my space, multiplying by any function f, then what I get is the expected value of the derivative of f. Now, there are a, little, a few funny things. First of all, there's a, a, a factor of 1 over n. This comes from the fact that we've normalized our, our entries to have variance 1 over n. The, the, the equation I wrote before was for Gaussians with variance 1. So if you go from Gaussians with variance 1 to Gaussians with variance n, there's a supplementary factor of 1 over n. Remember, we're using this differentiation, um, how do you call it, Inter integration by parts. So at some point, we had to differentiate e to the minus x squared. So if it's e to the minus x squared over sigma, the sigma will come out. And that's, that's 1 over n. The other funny thing is the switch here. It's ji versus ij. And the reason for it is the fact that we're looking at complex Gaussians. So actually, it's the derivative with respect to z bar applied to the function. That's the integration of z against the function. Um, and the reason is that I'm just switching indices as opposed to putting complex conjugates is because we have a self-adjoint matrix. So if you like, I could write this as omega k i j bar times f. Okay. All right, good. So now let's apply this identity. Nu n will be our Gaussian measure on these k tuples or d tuples of n by n matrices. And so let's look at the expected value of the kind of term we want to compute, which is xi multiplying some monomial. So I'm taking the kth matrix, a k n, and I'm multiplying it into a polynomial of a1 through a d. All right, well, if you think about it, that means that we're going to be summing over i and j. We're going to look at the jth entry of this ak, and we will multiply it by the ijth entry of this polynomial. This eij, eii, and ejj, these are just diagonal matrices with one in the jth or ith diagonal position. Okay, now we can use our uh, Gaussian integration trick to convert this into a partial derivative. So this is 1 over n squared times this partial derivative of that thing. And now, what is the partial derivative? The partial derivative is a directional derivative of my function, right? So what am I supposed to be doing? I'm supposed to be applying some kind of a derivation to this polynomial. But I told you that the difference quotients are universal. Any derivation factors through difference quotients. So in particular, the derivation where I d differentiate this polynomial as a function of all these entries in the ijth entry of the kth matrix, that's a derivation. It's going to be, it's going to factor through that. And if you do the algebra, you'll see that this is the formula. It's just the kth partial derivative, uh, diff sorry, kth difference quotient of p hashed eij, where eij is a, is a matrix with one in the ijth entry and zeros elsewhere. OK, now if you rewrite what that is and think for a second, what you come up with is this formula. So this is almost what we want. It's not the expected value. So, so here you have the normalized trace, tens of the normalized trace. We've picked up a factor of 1 over n when we're doing this Gaussian integration. The only problem is that we have the expectation of a product of traces as opposed to the product of expectations. If we had the product of expectations, we would be done because that's exactly what the formula that we want to prove uh, gives us. And well, here you use concentration. You use, ga use Gaussian concentration to prove that since the fluctuations of this trace are very small, it's pretty much almost equal to its average all the time. When you take its product with itself and you take the expectation of, of that product, it's the same thing as the product of expectations up to a small error that goes away as n goes to infinity. So in the end, you actually recover exactly this equation here, OK? So what I've done, actually, is a very short, see, what kind of one-page proof of just convergence to the semicircle law. 
um, I didn't put any, any algebra D into this con consideration. But actually, it's not such a big complication. If you throw in, in the, the, the algebra D, you just have to go through the motions and check that everything works out fine. And, and basically, because the entries of that algebra are constant, they will not be affected by these partial derivatives at all. And so uh, in this formula, there will be no contributing factor from them. So you might as well be just taking these DKs to kill that algebra. And that's what's going on. Okay? So that's more or less the proof of the theorem as I, as I stated it. All right, any questions about this? Okay, great. So now I want to talk a bit uh, about more complicated random matrix models. So here, uh, as I told you, we can, in the Gaussian case, we can interpret these uh, d tuples of n by n matrices as simply functions on uh, this, this space. And to make them Gaussian, it's enough to tell you what the Gaussian measure on this space is. And, and there's a very easy formula for this Gaussian measure using the fact that we are dealing with matrices. The Gaussian measure, let's call it nu n, is up to some normalization e to the minus n trace of some aj squared uh, d, let me write it as da1 dad, uh, but this just means Lebesgue measure. And in case you're wondering which Lebesgue measure, we'll identify, put a, a Hilbert space structure, a real Hilbert space structure um, on, th on the space of functions using this. Okay, so this will be the Gaussian measure here. Now there's a lot of interest in understanding what happens when instead of the Gaussian measure, you put something else. So you take some V, let's say a non-commutative polynomial in, in D matrices. Uh, so an example of this non-commutative polynomial is the sum of squares. And then you put uh, a measure of the following form. You take minus N trace V of A1 AD, uh, you exponentiate that, and then you have to renormalize it. Now, of course, if you write it like that, um, with an arbitrary polynomial, you, have, you may not have much happening, much interesting thing happening at infinity. So th this measure, as written, may have infinite integral over all matrices. So you may, you may have to put in a cutoff. So for instance, you may want to cut off insisting that all of your matrices have upper operator norm no bigger than some, some number r. But what turns out is that this r is irrelevant uh, after a little bit. So let's call, <coughs> um, so, so new nr. So let's say that I, I select some matrices here with respect to this law. I think I switched from new to new at some point. No, I didn't. I'm good. OK. So there's one of the first theorems in this subject is, uh, well, one of the first rigorous theorems in this subject uh, in the multi-matrix regime is due to Alice Guianet and Eduard morel Segala. And it says that, imagine that your potential V is a per small perturbation of the quadratic potential. So you're looking at the quadratic case plus epsilon times some W, where W is some arbitrary um, polynomial, uh, self-adjoint polynomial. Well, the claim is that basically uh, there is a certain sweet value of the cutoff after which the cutoff doesn't matter anymore. So uh, the law you have some convergence to limit law, and this limit law doesn't really de de depend on the cutoff anymore. Um, and so, so the, the statement is that you actually have convergence uh, to a certain limit law. Um, and in fact, this limit law depends analytically on this value epsilon here. And the other comment that I want to make is that if your potential W uh, splits up as a, as a sum of two things, then actually under this limit law, uh, if you split your family into the first R uh, and the last D minus R according to how your potential is split, then these two families end up being freely independent. So somehow uh, the reason that we were seeing this, this independence of the semicircular variables was because our Gaussian potential was a sum of functions of individual matrices. So how do you prove this? Well, you have to do a, a, a somewhat different integration by parts. So classically, if you are interested in one of these Gibbs measures, 
things of the form e to the minus v of x, then the, the integration by parts that I did gets replaced by this integration by parts. It says that if you integrate f of x, f of x not against x, but against v prime of x, then what you get is the integral of the derivative of f. Um, so you can do that very same proof that we did before uh, with, with the Gaussian uh, um, thing, only our target is instead of this equation here, that q times xi is this tau tensor tau of diq, is going to be a little different. Uh, this time around, you have to replace xi by what's called the ith cyclic derivative of v. So let me tell you what this ith cyclic derivative is. So if you want to be formal, di is m sigma composed with partial i, where m sigma from a tensor a to a is the map a tensor b gets sent into b a. So if you like, di of a monomial, let's call this monomial p, this will be the sum over all decompositions of p as a x i b of b times a. If you're wondering why would anybody ever want to deal with such a thing, uh, the reason for it is that actually if you look at uh, a partial derivative of a trace of some polynomial of a perturbation, like that, uh, let, take, take any trace uh, whatsoever, then what you get uh, if you take the derivative at epsilon equals zero is that you get tau of p times diq. And if you think about it, this explains why there's this reversal uh, of b and a, because you see when you differentiate this p, at some point you will, imagine it's a monomial, at some point you're splitting one of the x's and replacing it by q, and then the rest of the x's they have to come out, what did I write here, D, Q D I P. And then the rest of the x's, the, the, the remainder of p has to come out on the other side, and that's why you have this kind of cyclic, uh, cyclic behavior. Anyway, so if you, if you just do that same computation that I did with matrices, and just pay attention, you will find this formula here uh, in the limit, Again, you would have to prove some kind of concentration, but that's fine because for small uh, values of epsilon, this uh, measure that you put on, ma on matrices is going to be locally, strictly log concave, and so therefore you can apply things like log, log Sobolev inequality to deduce con concentration. Okay, so anyways, now if your V is the sum of quadratic plus a perturbation, then you can rewrite this equation in this form. You can write it as tau of xiq. That's what happens with the derivative here. Um, then that's going to be equal to tau tensor tau of diq minus, this is a typo, minus, what did I write? Sorry, I was typing this up at yesterday evening and I was a bit tired. Sorry, what should be is tau, let's just do it. So tau of di of some uh, xi squared plus epsilon w uh, times uh, q is equal to di of q, sorry, tau tensor tau of diq. And now if you rewrite this, what you get is tau of xi, because of, of what you have, uh, have here, plus tau of uh, epsilon w times q, and that's equal to tau tensor tau of diq. So at the end of the day, you get the equation that tau of xiq is equal to tau tensor tau of diq minus epsilon tau of w times q. So now if you think of your tau as a, yes. Oops, yeah, thank you. Um, so now if you think of your tau as a power series in epsilon, you see that um, when you increase the degree of q by 1, then you can express that in terms of either something with smaller degree in q or something with higher degree 
in epsilon. So in any case, you have a certain recursive formula that closes up, and then you have to do some work uh, to prove that actually this does converge and, and you know, give you an analytic function in, in, in epsilon and so forth. Uh, let me just tell you one, yeah, let me not do that slide. Let me just tell you if I have two minutes, do I have two minutes or, yeah? So I just want to tell you a nice diagrammatic interpretation of this equation in terms of counting planar objects. You might remember that for a Gaussian matrix, I've drawn these things flat, but you can draw them on the circle. If you're interested in the moment of a, a, a semicircular variable, something like that, then what you do is you put m points, one, two, three, up to m, and you're simply summing over certain diagrams d, uh, the number one, right? You're just counting how many diagrams you have. These are these non-crossing diagrams that you have like that. Now, you can modify things a little bit by putting other diagrams here and permitting some connections to these diagrams. Something like that, okay? Um, and now imagine that each one of these diagrams comes with a weight, let's call it beta. And let's just imagine that we have a formal, uh, formal way of evaluating such, such, such things. Then you will see um, that if I start with an equation like this, and I try to follow what a string does, well, the string goes into a kind of a soup here. You have a soup made of other strings, well, this whole soup. It's made out of other strings and maybe some W's floating in them. And so it depends on your luck. If you took your string, it might come back here like that. Well, if it comes back like that, then you just have, uh, uh, your soup just got split into two, right? Because the soup that's here is disjoined from the soup that's there. So you get a formula uh, which is something like uh, tau tensor tau of some derivative of x to the m, because you've, you've eliminated these two points, so you've taken some derivative. Or uh, you might be un unlucky and you might actually get to touch one of those w's, in which case you can kind of reel it in, and you have another term, which is this dw x. So I'm not doing justice to this, but I just want to put, put into your minds that there is some combinatorial structure with this counting of these so-called planar diagrams or planar maps that is, has the same kind of recursive behavior as this equation here. And that's, that's why there is a very nice connection with this. Right. Okay. Thanks. Thank you very much. Do you have any questions? Yeah, if not, uh, so we'll resume again in 10 minutes and thank Dima again. All right, thanks.